This module contains a description of mature tropical cyclone structure. We'll discuss the distribution of TCs globally, the mean flow in TCs, and II wall and rain bands. Tropical cyclones are among the most impactful weather phenomena occurring in the tropics. They are responsible annually for billions of dollars of damage globally and the loss of numerous human lives. Shown here is the spatial distribution of TCs throughout the world. TCs occur in the North Atlantic, East and Central Pacific north of the equator, West Pacific, South Indian Ocean, and in the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, as well as in the Southwestern Pacific. Most develop at low latitudes and eventually move poleward. Occasionally a tropical cyclone forms in the mid-latitudes, and very rarely they occur in an entirely different basin such as in the South Atlantic. One way of categorizing TCs by strength is using the Saffir-Simpson scale, which is based on maximum wind speed of a TC. Orange, pink, and red colors denote the tracks of the strongest TCs when they were most intense. Very strong TCs can happen in any basin where they occur, but they are most common over the warm waters of the West Pacific. This figure is similar to the last, but it only shows genesis points and tracks for TCs in the 1970s and 80s. The yellow shaded region represents the climatological contour of 26.5 degrees C SST during the same period. While most tropical cyclones formed over the warm SSTs, a few did not, particularly over the North Atlantic. Several requirements must be met for tropical cyclogenesis to occur. Many of these are the same as the general requirements for tropical convection to develop and persist. First, sufficient fluxes of energy from the ocean to the atmosphere must be possible. This usually requires a deep mixed layer of warm ocean temperatures, not only 26 degrees Celsius or greater, although a few TCs have developed over cooler SSTs. Ample moisture in the location of the initial vortex must be present also. This is because amplification of the TC vortex requires release of latent heat, which can only happen if convection grows deep. Dry air inhibits vertical growth of convection as discussed in previous modules, and if dry air reaches a TC core, then the cyclone weakens. The atmosphere must also be sufficiently unstable to support convective growth. Some additional criteria are required for TC genesis that didn't apply to the generic case of disorganized convection. First, ample relative vorticity must be present in the environment. Second, vertical wind shear must be weak, nominally less than about 15 knots. And finally, the vortex must generally be about 5 degrees of latitude away from the equator, where the Coriolis parameter is not essentially zero. Well-organized developing and mature tropical cyclones usually have a banded structure like that shown here. In the center of mature TCs is, of course, the eye, where a subsiding air prevents formation of deep convection. The eye is surrounded by an intense ring or partial ring of convection known as the eye wall. Sometimes two eye walls are present. In such cases, the outer eye wall is known as the secondary eye wall, and between the two eye walls is the moat region, a region of local subsidence where deep convection does not form. Rain bands then spiral outward from the center, sometimes several hundred kilometers away from the eye. The principal rain band is the largest, is directly connected to the core, and is sometimes contiguous with the secondary eye wall. The bands consist of convective precipitation, denoted by the dark shading, and weaker stratiform-like precipitation elsewhere in the rain bands. From satellite imagery, the detailed structure of the inner core and rain bands is usually difficult to discern. This is because the entire storm is covered by cirrus cloud that expands laterally from the center. However, passive microwave imagery can detect some of the precipitation features, which is particularly useful over open ocean. Near land or from a TC penetrating aircraft, radar can discern the detailed structure of TCs. Shown here is radar imagery of Hurricane Michael, just prior to his landfall along the Florida Panhandle in October 2018. At this point, Michael was a mature and intense Category 5 hurricane. An eye is obvious. 
It is surrounded by a partial ring of intense convection, with the strongest rain appearing to the northeast of the eye. A primary rain band is visible. Several additional rain bands far from the eye are also present and resemble the schematic displayed on the previous slide. A little while later, Michael made landfall as seen in this image. The eye is completely surrounded by an eye wall of intense convection, and a disconnected secondary eye wall can be seen as well. Rain between the primary and secondary eye walls was lighter in the so-called moat region, as denoted by the green colors. The primary band extends spirally outward from the secondary eye wall. This detail would be impossible to determine, to determine by simply looking at visible or infrared imagery. The inner eye wall of a mature hurricane is shown here from the inside of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. The photo was taken from an aircraft that penetrated the eye wall of Katrina and sampled temperature, humidity, wind speed, and direction and pressure, as well as made visual observations inside and surrounding the eye. Deep convection is absent inside the eye. Only shallow cumulus or stratocumulus is present. The eye wall cloud consists of deep, intense cumulonimbus clouds that slope upward and outward away from the eye. The shadow of the sun on one part of the eye wall can be seen in the right half of the image. Photos like these are captured from surveillance aircraft that fly into developing and mature tropical cyclones that threaten land. The U.S. Air Force Reconnaissance Squadron flies C-130 Hercules aircraft into tropical cyclones to collect weather radar and in situ observations. They are the primary reconnaissance aircraft that collect real-time observations used for characterizing tropical cyclones. NOAA also sometimes flies P-3 aircraft, called Miss Piggy and Kermit, into tropical cyclones. The P-3 usually flies higher than the C-130, which typically flies in the lowest 10,000 feet. The P-3 also contains three weather radars that can be used for operational characterization of a storm or later for research purposes. A cross-section cutout of an eye and eye wall is seen here, showing one quadrant of an idealized storm. The kinematic flow of the secondary circulation of the TC is shown with different arrows. In a future module and in homework, we'll further explore the dynamics behind some of these motions. In a TC, the primary flow refers to the tangential flow around the storm, and the secondary flow refers to the radial and vertical motion that accompanies the faster primary circulation. Arrows denoting the radial and tangential flow are shown here in blue, while X denotes flow into the screen. The primary energy source to the TC core is frictional radial inflow in the boundary layer. Convergence near the eye wall at low levels drives upward motion in the eye wall cloud, which rises following a slanted surface of constant angular momentum while releasing latent heat as water vapor condenses. The latent heat release in the eye wall supports a contraction of the eye wall and the radius of maximum wind, or RMW. Immediately along the inner edge of the sloped eye wall, saturated descent occurs. In the eye wall, forced descent occurs along a dry adiabat, forcing warming and stabilizing the atmosphere within the eye. As a result, deep convection is absent in the eye, although a shallow deck of stratiform cloud is present in the boundary layer. Light radially outward flow from the eye to the eye wall is present in the boundary layer and helps reinforce the convergence in the eye wall cloud. The mean radial wind and primary circulation are shown here. Although the left panel is derived from observations of Atlantic hurricanes and the right panel is from Pacific typhoons, the fundamental circulation structures are similar. Pressure is on the y-axis for both panels and radius is on the x-axis on the left in kilometers and the right of degrees of latitude, which is about 111 kilometers per degree of latitude. 
For radial wind, negative values indicate flow toward the center, inward toward the center. This occurs in the boundary layer with a maximum magnitude around 950 millibars. Radial outflow is seen in the upper troposphere, while the radial flow between the boundary layer and 300 millibars approximately is generally weak, close to the core. The tangential wind, or the flow around the storm, which is the primary circulation, is approximately in gradient wind balance to first order, and it becomes larger as one gets close to the center. The altitude of the wind maximum increases moving inward. Positive values in the right panel represent the magnitude of cyclonic flow around the vortex. An upper level anticyclone is common with this maximum flow located far from the core of the cyclone. Angular momentum can be defined as shown at bottom. Following fluid motion, it is conserved, an important constraint on kinematics for the flow. Isotherms of theta e in a tropical cyclone show a warm core center, meaning that theta e in the center exceeds the theta e immediately outside of the center at the same pressure level. The radial gradient of theta e in the inner core represents the magnitude of the warm core. That warm core is a result of dry adiabatic compression of subsiding air in the eye. And so the strength of the warm core decreases with height in upper levels of the storm. Above the zero degree sea level, or about right here, isentropes slope out radially with height. The subsiding warming air causes a minimum in geopotential at the center of the storm, which helps to enhance the pressure gradient across the eye wall cloud. It is this pressure gradient that primarily controls the strength of the primary circulation. Presence of a warm core is required for classification as a tropical cyclone. Cyclone phase space diagrams, like that shown here, can help one diagnose quickly if a cyclone is fully tropical. The phase space diagram classifies a vortex based on its symmetry and the strength of the warm core. This diagram shows an example of the evolution of Hurricane Sandy in the cyclone phase space starting at A in the Caribbean and progressing towards Z. The storm developed as a symmetric warm core cyclone over the Caribbean before losing its symmetry, partially due to shear, as it moved northward along the east coast of the US. As the cyclone approached the mid-Atlantic coastline, it transitioned into a cold core non-tropical cyclone. The y-axis defines the thermal asymmetry near the cyclone center, while the strength of the warm core is defined here by the negative magnitude of the thermal wind vector in the lower troposphere. Consider the definition of the thermal wind shown at bottom, and recall from your dynamics class that the thermal wind describes a shear vector. In this case, it is the change of the magnitude of the geostrophic wind between 900 and 600 millibars. The warm core cyclone, or having a temperature that decreases moving radially from the cyclone, imposes the condition that the geostrophic wind should decrease with height. In contrast, the primary circulation will increase in magnitude with height in a cold core cyclone. This figure shows another cross section through a mature TC, with theta E contours displayed on the left through the eyewall cloud and surrounding cloud. The theta E contours are parallel to contours of constant angular momentum, meaning that ascent in the eye wall is approximately isentropic. The right panel also shows temperature contours as dashed lines and tangential wind contours as solid lines. Temperature lines also show weakening of the warm core with height. The temperature gradient here is larger than it is here, for example. Note also how the radius from the center at which the maximum wind occurs is further from the center, high in the storm, than it is in the low troposphere. Furthermore, as seen in a previous slide, the maximum tangential wind occurs somewhere above 900 millibars. In a homework problem, 
You'll argue for why the eye wall must be sloped, as pictured in this diagram. Finally, the frameworks that we have viewed so far are for idealized axisymmetric tropical cyclones, meaning that they essentially have the same distribution in all quadrants. However, in nature, tropical cyclones can rarely even be approximated as truly axisymmetric because vertical wind shear impacts the distribution of latent heating in the tropical cyclone. Consequently, the secondary circulation is often largely asymmetric, being stronger in one part of the cyclone than in another. A tropical cyclone can be broken up into four shear relevant quadrants to describe this asymmetric circulation. In the eye wall, updrafts tend to first develop in the down shear half of the storm. They then rotate around the eye cyclonically while precipitating. By the time convection rotates around to the up shear side of the storm, convection is mostly dissipated and downdrafts are present. Therefore, an eye wall often appears to be asymmetric, appearing sometimes as only part of a ring located at least in the down shear left part of the storm. The secondary circulation is strongest, therefore, in the down shear right quadrant and diverging flow into the eye at upper levels is much more common within the shear relative left side of the storm. Motions tend to be comparably weak in the up shear right quadrant. The behavior described is an average across many storms, and various storms have differences in their exact kinematic structure. However, the resulting rainfall pattern is often observed, as seen here again in the case of Hurricane Michael. The strongest radar echo in the inner eye wall is located to the left of the shear vector, with the down shear right being the quadrant with the weakest echo 